So it's been about six months that I've owned the Chroma 617, and I have to say it's been an amazing experience. Shooting 617 is a challenging format at the best of times, and the Chroma 617 is an amazing entry into that format. It removes a lot of the complexities that you might get from something like a Shen Hao, and yet at the same time giving you a taste of what 617 photography is capable of. Going into it, I knew that I wanted to minimise the amount of options I had, so to speak, with shooting with this format, so that I could dial in and learn the process. So I only was, I decided to stick to one lens, a 135mm lens, and things like uh, movements of rise, shil rise, shift, tilt and so on, I wanted to sort of set those aside for the time being so that I could actually just learn the process. And the Chroma 617 is great for this. As a view camera without any movements, it allows me to focus on the one thing, which was learning the aspect ratio. But as I knew it would eventually happen, after I started shooting with it and really starting to feel comfortable with the format, I started to feel that urge to have things like different focal lengths, different lenses, and the ability to perhaps maybe use some tilt and shift or rise and fall to adjust a shot. What's the next step? Do I buy a 90mm wider lens for the Chroma 617? Is that the next step? And whilst that definitely is an option, uh, it comes with its own challenges. Because the Chroma 617, the way that that kind of style of camera works, has a lens cone for each lens. It comes with a lens cone for each lens. So this is the lens cone for a 135mm lens. It has a helicoid on the top, which allows you to focus, and it just snaps in with some incredibly strong magnets into Chroma 617, and there you've got your very portable uh, camera system. That in itself is great, but then when you start thinking about, oh, I want to buy another lens or another couple of lenses, you then have to start considering the investment of uh, lens cones for each of those lenses, the amount of space they take up, and also the cost. When I started doing the math, I started thinking, well, okay, maybe it would be make more sense to buy a view camera. So obviously the, the simple solution would be a Shenhao 617. It is arguably the best 617 uh, view camera you can get. It gives you all of the rise and fall and tilt and movements and so on you could possibly want. Incredible build quality from uh, all, all reports. Um, and effectively has zero limitations when it comes to the format. One limitation being, of course, the price, which apparently keeps on going up, not down. After my incredibly painful investment in my uh, Hasselblad uh, X-Pan, I didn't have a lot of money left over to go and buy myself uh, a Shenhao. So the next option was something like a 4x5 camera. Now, Chroma actually make a GraphLock adapter for their film backs that allows you to attach their film back to a 4x5 camera, which is a spectacular way of modularizing their, their system. However, shooting uh, 617 on a 4x5 camera does have some slight limitations. So then I thought, why not do a DIY approach? I'm a big proponent in learning about things by pulling them apart, putting them back together, and so on. And I think that's one of the ways you can really become uh, expert at something is if you know how each and every single component works you understand the entire process better. Being that a view camera in its basic form is a fairly simple object it is effectively a front standard which holds the lens, a rear standard which holds the film and bellows which stops light between those front and rear standards and some way of controlling those, those two components the front and the rear standard in relation to each other in a somewhat precise manner, I thought, well, what's stopping me from doing that? Let's get onto eBay and see if I can find maybe a damaged view camera or something that's got the, the skeleton that I need, even if most of it isn't, isn't working or isn't where it needs to be, I can then add my components on top of that. But the basic components might be enough to get me uh, started on, on building a camera. So off it was onto eBay. And searching, you know, old view cameras, something jumped up fairly quickly that was sort of rather head scratching. There were four by five cameras and their requisite price. There were eight by ten cameras, but then there was a large listing or a large number of listings for these half plate cameras. These half plate cameras had a strange frame size of four and three quarters by six and a half, and 
when I started researching it, I was like, well, hang on, it's not four by five and it's not eight by 10. What is this film format? And it's an older style of film format, which really isn't in use as much today. However, there are a lot of these cameras available on eBay. These film cameras, which shoot at half size, half plate uh, film size, were made in the 1920s, 1930s, and there are a lot of them available on eBay in a variety of qualities. Considering how old these cameras are, it's no surprise that uh, a lot of them are, have seen better days. But the important thing is they had exactly what I needed, the bare skeleton of, of, of items that I needed that I could then build on. So off it was to eBay, searching multiple listings, trying to find the right camera. I wanted something that was not in a terrible state that required a lot of work, but at the same time I didn't want to pay a premium for an especially nice looking version, which I was then going to gut and pull apart, which realistically is it's not something I really wanted to do. After a bit of searching, I found a camera that I think fit my bill. It looked like it had all of the bits and pieces attached to it that it needed. Um, it didn't look like there was any major damage to the camera, but importantly, it came with a couple of film backs and I was going to need those because I was going to need to be able to reverse engineer how they attached to the camera. And most importantly, it was quite cheap, working out about $200 Australian plus shipping. Once the camera arrived and I pulled it apart, I was incredibly happy with the, the unit that, I, that I'd selected. Uh, other than some very slight problems of one or two of the, uh, uh, the, the wheels on one side seemed to be stuck and almost rusted together. I'm guessing there was some water damage there. Everything else worked and worked quite smoothly. The camera uh, opened and closed correctly. Um, all of the movements seemed to be really nice and smooth and there was very little issue there. Obviously the bellows were completely shot as you would expect from a camera which is possibly in the realm of you know, 80 to 100 years old. But the important part was the skeleton was there. The film backs, completely made out of timber, were an amazing design. And when I attached them to the camera and saw how they connected and disconnected, that gave me a real boost because it was a real positive connection. And so that was one of my concerns was how I was going to be able to remove, or connect and remove a film back regularly with no light leaks. Um, but seeing how they were able to do this with timber in a, in a fashion where it was precise enough that there was no uh, light leaks, led me to believe that I should be able to reproduce this in 3D printing with only minimal amount of work. So the first step was designing the, the cassette, as it were, that would hold the film. Um, so it's a fairly simple design, realistically, when you think about it. Um, I utilised the Shen Hao and the, and the Dayi film backs as kind of a, your basic idea, and I also used the Chroma just to sort of get an idea of placement of items. But realistically, there's a hole here, which is where your, your film spindle goes. It travels across here. This is the film plane where your film will be exposed. And then over here, the, the take-up side, um, where your take-up spindle is. Um, they're the main components um, of, of the, the film cassette. This is the basic form. You've got yourself a box um, that, that's the film. Film goes here, over to here. Um, I then sketched uh, some top element items and cut out where the film is going to go. So film goes here, runs across here, out through there. Um, and then a bunch of little champers and so on. Um, I love champers in, champers in 3D modeling because it makes even the crappiest 3D model look uh, professional. Every other film back that I've had and every other camera that I've ever used, the film starts here, travels across here and is wound onto here. That would normally be the case with the film back. However, because the, the design of my film back, it's actually reversed. My film is actually going on to the camera this way. So this is the start, this is the end. So when you rotate it around and look at it, it's reversed. And I knew I was gonna mess this up. I knew that at some stage I'd be rushing, loading film, and I'd load film the wrong way. So what I did is firstly, I put some arrows here that reminds me that film needs to start here and ends here. So when I'm loading my film, I can look at those arrows, that'll remind me. And then when I'm using the camera, I have my winding arrows that remind me which way I need to wind to wind on the film and which way the, 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 the takeoff spindle will be ro rotating that allows me to know that film is being wound across. Once I had the camera pulled apart and I was pretty happy with how everything was gonna work, I decided to address probably what was gonna be the most complicated part for me which was the film back. I knew there were two issues that I was going to have to address uh, very precisely to have this whole process work. One was the tolerances of the film back itself. 
I knew that I was going to have to replicate the existing film back with my 3D printed film back. I thought, well, if they're able to do this with timber, I must be able to do this with 3D printed items. If they can produce a timber film back, on a, you know, obviously replicated on you know, many hundreds, if not thousands of these, then I should be able to re replicate those tolerances using 3D printing. The other area was probably, as far as this entire process, this was the thing that was going to worry me the most and it was the area that I was concerned about the most. And that was the film plane. So I knew that the way that I was going to have to design this was that you've got your ground glass, and the ground glass allows you to focus and see what's in frame and what's in focus and so on. And that ground glass effectively is the film until you put the film on. So whatever the ground glass sees is what your film will see. If the ground glass is in focus, then your film will be in focus. So the first step was once I disassembled the uh, existing uh, film back, I was able to place that in and then do some measurements to compare where it held the film compared to where when I put the ground glass on where the film plane was there. And I, I was able to see, you know, the, the, the tolerances were fairly close. It was, I was going to have to be as precise as I possibly could. This also drove my other decision, which was a sort of a difference from pretty much any other film back that I've seen, which is I decided that because of the limitations of 3D printing and the tolerances or the amount of, uh, of uh, thicknesses I was going to need for things like with 3D printing was I was going to move the dark slide from the film cassette or the film container onto the actual camera back or the film back. My reasoning for this is very simple. With something like the Shen Hao or the Dai film backs, they, you load the film in and you've got the film back and then you have the dark slide on that. Um, they, the distance between where the film is and the dark slide is millimetres at best because you obviously want to be able to put that film back into the camera at a very precise point can't do that with 3D printing. I needed at least a couple of millimetres to be able to print one side, a gap for the dark slide, another slide, room to hold um, something like felt or something in there to, to, to seal it. I needed some room and that just physically wasn't going to work on the film back itself. By moving the dark slide onto the plate, because the plate's significantly bigger, I have a lot more room vertically and horizontally to play with. Now, the reason why making the dark slide bigger was important to me was giving me room. So if unless if it, it, tolerances are always the thing that's going to kill you. Whereas if I made my dark slide bigger, that gives me a little bit more room to make mistakes, to hide my crimes as it were. And then we come to the bellows. This was an area which I thought initially was going to be one of the easier parts of the process. Little did I know. Um, I found a website that you can punch in the exact uh, elements of your uh, bellows replacement, the, the width and height of your of the rear uh, standard, the width and height of the front standard, the number of folds in the bellow, the distance or the, the, the length of extension that you require from your bellows, you punch all of those numbers in and uh, for I think it's like $10 Australian, it's a South African company, so I think it's like 7 or 80 Rand, um, uh, I was able to produce a, uh, it, it'll give you a PDF file with a perfectly sized uh, template for your bellows. And then came the process of cutting them out. That just takes a long time. You have to be very precise and cut out each and every single element um, for every side of the bellows in uh, effectively in card, and that'll give you the, the strength that holds up the material that uh, forms the bellow. Now, I'm gonna be honest with you here. I didn't just do it once. I didn't just do it twice. It took three goes. The first one came out technically, was a bellow, but it was way off. I went back and did it again with a second set of bellows. My second set of bellows, I got a little bit quicker at it, I got a little bit better at it, which is the whole point of this process. Um, and I was able to produce it probably in about four hours, give or take. Second one got to the point of I was able to fold it down as a set of bellows, and whilst it was not perfectly square, I felt it was going to work. And uh, after leaving it for a couple of days so that the, uh, the folding of the bellows would sort of set in, into the material, pulling it apart, it looked like a set of bellows and it looked like it was going to do the job. However, once again, when I put it in the camera, in its folded state, it was still a little bit too thick 
so that the camera would not close completely. And so I did it again, a third set of bellows. This time around, I used all of my learnings from the first two. I took my time. Um, I got new material that was thinner, uh, but still light, light proof or light, light, light tight. Um, and I was able to produce a, bellow, a set of bellows, which I was happy with. They fit in the camera. They allow the camera to close. They are not exactly square. There's just, just a slight amount of angle on them, which really bothers me. However, functionally, they work. Now, if I'm completely honest, I will be ordering a set of bellows custom made for this camera uh, from a company in China. Um, because whilst the whole aim of this camera was to learn the process and to do it myself and not just pay for a camera that's working perfectly, I feel that I've learnt a lot about making bellows and I've also learnt a lot about the limitations of me making bellows. So I feel that comfortable in, I've given it my all, I've spent a fair amount of money making multiple sets of bellows. Um, and even though the, the bellows that I'm ordering are actually gonna cost roughly the same price as the actual camera cost, um, I feel it's good investment. Now I hate to do this to you, but this video is already significantly longer than I was expecting it to be. And so I've made the painful decision to split it up into two videos, chapter one and chapter two. So this is unfortunately going to be the point where I leave you. Um, and uh, next week we'll have chapter two where we uh, continue on with the camera. So until then, say hi to your dog for me. <laughs>